Coming up today, South Korea warns North Korea that it will face even deeper international isolation if it makes good on its recent provocation threats. The U.S. admits it may take more than economic sanctions to keep the regime in line. The head of Lotte Group, one of Korea's biggest conglomerates, is set to appear at the National Assembly to explain the group's murky ownership structure to lawmakers. Plus, we'll soon know whether the U.S. Federal Reserve will raise interest rates from near zero for the first time in around a decade. Stay tuned for these stories and more. Hello, it's noon on Thursday, the 17th of September. You're tuned in to our midday newscast here on Arirang TV. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, the chairman of Korea's fifth largest conglomerate, Lotte Group, will appear before a parliamentary inspection later today. Shin Dong-bin's appearance will mark the first time for an acting chief of a so-called Chebol to appear at the National Assembly to face lawmakers' questions. He's expected to answer questions about the conglomerate's convoluted cross-shareholding and management structure. Lotto Group's lack of corporate transparency recently came under the spotlight and angered local consumers. This after a bitter family feud erupted between Shin and his elder brother Dongju over control of Lotto Group. It's decision time at the U.S. Federal Reserve, which is deep into discussions now on whether to raise interest rates for the first time since 2006. September has long been flagged as the month for a possible rate hike, but conflicting economic data could prompt a delay. Sun Jung-in reports. The U.S. Central Bank's Rate Setting Committee has kicked off its much-awaited September meeting. During the two-day affair, the 12 members of the Federal Open Markets Committee will discuss whether to raise interest rates for the first time in more than nine years. Global economists are evenly split on the pivotal decision after some conflicting signals from the latest economic data. On the plus side, the country's job growth has been improving. The U.S. unemployment rate fell to 5.1 percent in August, a level the Fed sees as likely to boost both wages and inflation. On the other hand, consumer prices took an unexpected tumble in August. The U.S. Labor Department said Wednesday that its consumer price index, a key measure of inflation, slipped 0.1 percent from July after having risen in the previous seven months. Another inflation measure, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, was up just 0.3 percent in July from a year ago. This is why some economists believe the Fed will hold off on a rate hike until later this year. Inflation target is around 2 percent over the next two or three years. That forecast is not there. There is no need to rush to do it. Korea is among the countries eagerly awaiting the outcome of the meeting. Local officials have projected that if Korea's lending interest rate increases 0.25 percentage points, assuming the Fed raises its rates, it would result in an annual loan interest income of 1.5 billion U.S. dollars. The committee's decision will be announced on Friday at 3 a.m. Korea time. Fed Chair Janet Yellen is expected to hold a press conference shortly afterward to explain the reasons behind the move. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, back here in Korea, an illegal trade transactions topped 9 trillion won, or roughly 7.7 .7 billion U.S. dollars last year, according to a report by the Korea Customs Service. That's an increase of about 6 percent from the previous year. Of the figure, the majority of illegal trade involved the violation of foreign exchange rules, including money laundering, which amounted to $5.7 billion. It was followed by smuggling and transactions that violated country of origin rules. The customs office attributed the increase to Korea's expanding trade volume and a tightened crackdown on the underground economy. In addition, rewards to people who report illegal activities have increased. Now, with the ongoing uncertainty in the global economy, more and more foreign investors are pulling their money out of major emerging markets with Korea seeing some of the biggest losses in recent weeks. Guan Suat reports. 
The stock market volatility caused by the China risk, the possibility of a U.S. rate hike, and the weak global economy is threatening emerging countries, which have seen foreigners pull assets from their equity markets in recent weeks. According to the Korea Center for International Finance, Korea saw the biggest losses among major Asian emerging markets, with more than 5.2 billion U.S. dollars pulled from its stock market in a span of two months. India saw a loss of almost $3.3 billion in the same period, followed by Thailand and Taiwan. In the past four weeks alone, the capital outflow in Korea amounted to almost $3.9 billion. Foreign investors in Korea continued their heavy selling streak for a 29th straight session on Korea's main benchmark Kospi from early August through Tuesday. It was the second longest one in history. The proportion of foreigners' net sold shares also dropped to the lowest level so far this year, standing at a little less than 31.9 percent, an around two percentage point drop from the end of last year. However, with offshore investors back on a buying position to pick up local stocks, analysts say Korea will see a much faster influx of cash than others, as the country's economic fundamentals remain stronger than other developing countries, especially as Korea's credit rating was recently bumped up a notch by major global agencies. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. Now, South Korea and the United States have again made clear that North Korea should be prepared to face even more time in the international wilderness if it goes ahead with a planned rocket launch next month. Connie Kim reports. South Korea says North Korea will only increase its isolation and face additional UN sanctions if the regime forges ahead with a satellite launch. The South's chief nuclear envoy, Hwang Jung-guk, told reporters in Washington on Wednesday, North Korea's satellite launch is aimed at advancing its nuclear weapons delivery capabilities. His remarks come after the North hinted earlier this week it would launch a long-range rocket and said it's ready to conduct a nuclear test. After Pyongyang successfully launched a satellite in 2012, the United Nations imposed sanctions, saying it was a banned test of ballistic missile technology. The technology used for a satellite launch is directly applicable to that used in ballistic missile development. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry also said on Wednesday it may take more than economic sanctions to end the nuclear threat coming from Pyongyang. He did not elaborate but said Washington is talking with South Korea, Japan, China and Russia to address Pyongyang's violation of all U.N. Security Council resolutions. Experts say that until North Korea gives up its nuclear and missile programs, the pressure on the reclusive regime to denuclearize will continue. According to a Voice of America report on Thursday, Canada said it will support actions taken if Pyongyang launches an additional provocation, and Austria demanded North Korea withdraw from all activities banned by the UN Security Council. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The South Korean ambassador to the United Nations is seeking ways to introduce Japan's wartime system of sexual slavery to the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Ambassador Oh Joon made the remarks during a parliamentary inspection session by Korea's Foreign Affairs and Unification Committee held in New York City on Wednesday. The ambassador said he was asked by Seoul's Ministry of Gender, Equality and Family in 2013 to bring the issue up for discussion at the UN Commission. He said he would make it happen by next year. The ambassador also said he was reviewing ways to designate a Remembrance Day for sex slavery victims separate from June 19th, which the UN declared the International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict. And on a related note, some Korean victims of Japan's wartime system of sexual slavery have filed for damages from the Japanese government. The victim's lawyer says he plans to launch the lawsuit in the coming weeks. The 10 victims are said to be seeking around 100 million won, or 85,000 US dollars each. The, law, uh, the lawyer had asked the Korean government for help, but was informed by the Ministry of Justice that Seoul was not in the legal position to provide much help in this case. The victims had tried to get compensation back in 2013, but the court in Japan has been ignoring the women's claims and have been returning documentation sent by them. Many watchers believe Japan is stalling and hoping the issue will go away. When the now elderly victims pass away, only 47 victims registered with the Korean government are still alive. 
Japan's parliament remains in deadlock over a set of controversial security bills proposed by Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Opposition lawmakers further delayed a key committee vote on the bills originally scheduled for this morning by blocking the committee chair from entering the parliament, as you can see there. Now, thousands continue to gather outside the parliament to protest the legislation, which, if enacted, uh, would allow Japanese troops to fight overseas for the first time since World War II. Despite the fierce opposition, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party is expected to pass the bills as it has a majority in the Diet together with its junior coalition partner. A powerful 8.3 magnitude earthquake has struck central Chile, sparking tsunami warnings and evacuation alerts. The U.S. Geological Survey says the tremor hit Wednesday night local time and was centred off the coast, some 230 kilometres northwest of the capital. Now, according to local authorities, buildings swayed in Santiago and thousands of people poured out onto the streets to try and stay safe. At least two people have been killed and about 10 people injured. Tsunami warnings are still in effect for Chile and Peru and a tsunami watch is in effect for Hawaii. New Zealand and Japan are also on the alert for possible tsunami waves. The Korean embassy in Chile says there have been no reports of casualties among Korean nationals living there. The refugee crisis in Europe is turning increasingly ugly. Hungarian police have unleashed tear gas and water cannon on thousands of refugees during clashes on the hungry Serbia border. The police say they reacted when refugees threw plastic bottles and demanded the border be reopened. Now, footage shows refugees, including some young children, with injuries after the clashes. The United Nations has criticised the severity of the response. UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon says he was shocked and alarmed at the ill treatment of refugees at the border. He stressed that the refugees should be treated with dignity and their human rights respected. However, Hungary is steadfast and says the crossing with Serbia will remain closed for the next 30 days. Now, for 45 years, the Semaul Undong, or the New Village Movement, has propelled Korea's modernization and is now even spreading to other countries as a model for sustainable development. Here's our Oh Soo Young with part two of her special series on Semaul Undong. Korea is one of the world's poorest countries in the years following the end of the Korean War. The Semaurundong movement has since been credited with putting Korea on the path to becoming the modern and relatively wealthy nation it is today. Launched by the government in 1970, it inspired community development based on diligence, self-help and cooperation. Villagers toiled together to build new roads and infrastructure. They also undertook agricultural reforms. Spreading from village to village, Semai's can-do spirit quickly became a nationwide movement. In under a decade, Korea's per capita income spiked more than fivefold, hitting more than 1,500 US dollars. The country also achieved significant growth in health, education, industry and transportation. Since then, Korea has been helping other countries build their own Semai villages by training leaders, sharing technology and setting up the necessary infrastructure. Now, leaders and experts from 60 countries are paying homage to the movement at the Global Semao Rundong Forum. They're showing the Semai spirit of unity with an early morning walkathon. Participants are also joining hands to launch an international organization called the Global Semao Development Network. The organization has been launched to help people in poverty around the world by sharing this Hemal spirit, nurturing leaders, exchanging information and implementing projects. This will help spread Korea's Hemal Rundong across developing nations, helping them tackle poverty and make better lives for their people. Oh Soo Young, Arirang News, Gyeongju.
Well, that's pretty much all we have for now. I'm Mark Broom. If you want to catch up on more news, don't forget to check out the website adirang.com forward slash news. Also, check out the smartphone application that can be found by searching for Adirang TV at the usual places. Have a great day. Thank you, as always, for watching. Goodbye.